Uh, I forgot to bring my gold medal with me today. <laughs> and uh, I apologize. And if anybody's having a birthday, I'll talk to you later about putting it on your neck. <laughs> Before I get started, though, I really wanted to acknowledge two people, Noah Kim and Steve Fong. These are two people who have actually framed the problem that we're faced with in education today and boldly defined what we need to do to change. And both of you all, I really applaud you. Thank you very much. Big hand for them. Okay, there's this urban legend that chemists are great cooks. <laughs> and my wife would challenge that. She'd say it's probably more of a myth than a legend. But um, I want to talk to you today about some technology that we think is going to be transformational and it's causing the pharmaceutical industry to rethink how drugs are going to be manufactured in the 21st century. And it's also uh, going to actually affect how uh, the paradigm for a distribution of health care globally. And uh, this is a picture of a round bottom flask. And a round bottom flask is my gimba. It's actually, it's actually, it's actually where we act, look at how to make molecules. And what I have in my pocket, this is a 21st century round bottom flask. It's a flow reactor, and it's actually an entirely different way of making molecules. And I want to use some uh, cooking analogies to actually explain the difference between these two systems. So if you look at, the flow, uh, at a batch reactor, I'm going to talk about batch reactor versus continuous chemical processing. And if you think about a, a round bottom flask as a batch reactor, it's kind of like making spaghetti sauce. You take everything, you dump it in a pot, you heat it up, you cool it down, and then you dump it out. Well, a flow reactor is more like making pasta. It's uh, a continuous operation where you're continuously feeding in your raw materials and you're continuously taking your product out. Now, these flow reactors are very unique in that they have a very small footprint and they can produce a lot of material very quickly. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But the, the message that I want you to carry away with this is all the pasta tastes the same, but each batch of spaghetti sauce is just a little bit different. And that's great when you're making spaghetti, but not when you're making drugs. So uh, this, is where we're, <laughs> this is where the real opportunity is. So how could this impact our society? Well, the first thing I want to talk about is the military. The um, military, uh, uh, the Department of Defense is actually considering this technology as a way of being able to supply drugs in the combat field on demand, using these small reactors to be able to produce these drugs. Now, think about that. If you can make drugs in a combat zone, why can't you make them in your pharmacist? This is where we're headed with this kind of technology in a decentralized manufacturing uh, mode. Now, I do a lot of work in catalysis, and that's basically speeding up chemical reactions. And um, I was working with the folks at NASA, and the folks at NASA, I was telling them about this idea with the, uh, with, uh, that the Department of Defense had for this thing. They were called putting, making drugs on the back of a Humvee. And uh, the NASA folks says, Frank, that's the holy grail of space travel. How many of you guys remember Dr. McCoy from Star Trek? You remember the thing he had where he stuck everybody in the arm and he got well? That's what they're talking about. And this is kind of the predecessor to that, where we think that we can actually, for extended space travel, you can actually produce drugs on demand in space. But the thing I'm really passionate about is the third topic. And that's being able to engage the third world economies and to be able to be self-sufficient and make their own drugs in a decentralized manner. And this is actually something that people, it's a, it's, it's a pretty well-kept secret these days. People don't realize how big an issue AIDS is today. How many people know that AIDS is growing at a rate of 14% a year globally? And that 30% of all women in South Africa of childbearing age have AIDS. This is a problem, and we're not addressing it. 
we think this is one of the ways that it's an enabling technology that we can provide the South African people with a way to be able to produce their own drugs, reduce the cost, and increase the availability. Uh, so the question you might ask yourself is, why is this? Why aren't we adapting this kind of technology? And there's some barriers to this, and I want to talk about that. So this is really a, a technology paradigm shift. And when you start thinking about it, the best analogy I can make is the cellular telephone industry. Now think about it for a second. Who were the first people to actually use cellular telephone technology? India and China. Why do you think that is? It's because of the fact that they, didn't, they weren't encumbered by hardwired technology that we had. We were very slow to pick that up because we were encumbered by our own investments. So the chemical manufacturing operations have the same issue. They've got batch manufacturing investments, and it's going to be slow for them to pick it up. But these emerging technologies can actually do it. Now, the last thing I want to talk to you about are the skill sets that are needed, and that's one of the problems that you actually have in this area. And that is the fact that you need multidisciplinary, um, a, a multidisciplinary approach to solving these problems. So you need these three skill sets. You need to be able to be a, a good chemist. You need to be a good engineer. And the other thing you do is you have to be able to take measurements because these, these devices can make a lot of material very quickly, but they can make a lot of bad material very quickly. So you've got to be able to have real-time measurement to be able to uh, monitor the product quality. And uh, the, we think this is actually the innovation point for these types of things. So uh, one of the things, that my group actually reflects this, my research group, and I tell them every day three things. One is that innovation occurs at the interface of different disciplines. Secondly, you need to be looking at a lot of different stuff. And lastly, you need to look at the same stuff differently. Now, really what we're talking about when we're talking about these three, three things is a theme that's actually carried through most of our speakers today. And that is you've got to get out of your comfort zone. That's getting out of your comfort zone. Having a, an engineer work side by side with a chemist. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're all here today, to get out of our comfort zones and learn more about how to change the world. Thank you.